Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for 10 Hacks for Better Mobile Marketing. My name is Erica Moss, Community Manager here at Bitly, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. A few housekeeping items, a copy of this recording will be available in the next few days and will be sent to the email at which you registered. To ask questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat box or on Twitter using the hashtag BetterMobile. I'm here with my colleague Blaze Lucy, Senior Content Strategist, who will be co-presenting today's webinar. Blaze has been building content programs for startups and Fortune 500s for the past five years and you can find him on Twitter at BlazeLucy00. Also joining us is Brian Howell, Head of Marketing at Branch Metrics, which is a deep linking attribution and analytics tool for developers and mobile marketers. He has six years of mobile marketing experience and has run successful developer and consumer marketing programs. You can find him on Twitter at Brian T. Howell. So what are we going to tackle today? We're really going to take a deep dive into the app landscape. There are 1.5 million of them in the App Store, but about 80% of them don't get downloaded enough to start ranking. So we'll look at the state of the state, specific ways to promote your app using things like App Store optimization, deep linking, and push notifications, as well as examples and use cases from brands that are doing it well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Blaze. Thank you, Erica. Um, so, as Erica mentioned, we wanted to start off by covering the app landscape. So whether you've already launched an app or you're just trying to think about launching an app or you're just recalibrating your app marketing, it's important to look at what's happening today and what the challenges there are. As Erica mentioned, there are a lot of apps in the App Store, both on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. So if you just launched your app, you're a small fish in a huge pond teeming with other small fish. And you can really see that in these numbers. So out of all of those apps, 83% of them are something that are called zombie apps. This means that they don't appear in any of the top 300 lists in the App Store across 23 genres and 18 subgenres. And you also don't have placements in paid or free lists. If it's essentially, the only way people can find these apps is by typing the app name into the App Store. And so these apps are pretty much inactive with very few downloads and very few users. And you can see from this chart that depending on the category of your app, you're going to see different rates of zombification. Entertainment and games are at the biggest risk, while weather apps, where competition is smallest, are least likely to become zombies because people keep checking the weather. It's important to look at these charts and think about where, where and how your app will interact against the competition and how you can prevent it from becoming a zombie. The biggest challenge, uh, I'd say an anti-zombie challenge, right, is that app user retention is very, very low. As this chart shows, the average app loses 77% of its daily active users within the first three days after an installation. Within 30 days, that number climbs to 90%. So it's a safe bet that the huge majority of your users are going to abandon your app after just a few tries. They download it, try it out, and then move on. Making a great app can only get you halfway. Then it's all about marketing and promoting it. Not just to get new users, but to remind your current users that your app is pretty great and they should keep using it. Brian, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about zombification and the issues uh, here in this chart. Yeah, no, thank you. It was, it, it's really interesting to actually look at this retention number and compare it to the idea of how impossible it is to rank in the App Store and maybe feel a little overwhelmed. One of the things I actually wanted to point out on this chart is it's, what we've noticed is that concept of taking your app and then exploring it and deciding to delete it is actually, uh, we, we actually see it a little bit earlier. People usually don't even get through an onboarding flow or become an active user. And so one of the things that we'll talk about is how important it is to engage people right off the bat. Um, and so these numbers, while dire, also assume that the vast majority of people don't think about that initial context and think about how to improve it. So even though this seems bad, there's hope. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. And part of the other problem here is that marketing an app is really, really expensive. If you're using something like paid Facebook ads to target your audience, you're likely going to spend an average of $3.39 per, per install. 
that's not so bad if you want one or two users, but most of us want more, right? And if you want 100,000 users, that's going to cost you more than a quarter million dollars. And that's not even counting the fact that we just covered, which is that most people that you pay for to acquire are just going to download the app, try it out, and then delete it. So this is the real challenge, right? It's not just about getting installs. It's about finding ways to keep people engaged after they've installed and have them keep coming back to the app. And that's where our 10 mobile hacks come in. So hack number one is all about app store optimization. This is more of an art than science. Things are changing all the time, and there are really a million different factors are involved, most of which are really hard to understand. Um, Sometimes it seems a little bit like witchcraft. But what we do know is that it's important. The number one way that people find apps, whether they're iPhone users, as this chart shows, or Android users, is that they searched for it in the App Store. So you need to think about when people search for new apps, what does your app look like to them? So if they find it through the App Store, if they've heard about it and they look for it, you need to make sure that all of the information in, about your app is optimized for, for that search. Oh, can I make one quick comment there? Go ahead. Which is, one of the things that's really interesting about this is how different of a model this is for finding anything that you want before mobile existed, or even in your day-to-day -day life, not on your phone. People do not go to the App Store to look for things. They go to Google. And What's interesting about this process is how divergent it is. And so this is self-reported data. These people are telling us that this is how they find apps. But they're forced to find them this way. This is not what would happen naturally if the app stores kind of fit into the ecosystem more efficiently. Right. I think that's a great point. And yeah, basically, your app only has the app store as the way for people to find it. They could have heard it from somewhere else. Um, this this self-reported data. People searched for it. Why did they search for it? How did they hear about it originally? Did they really just find it by trolling through the App Store? Um, these are questions that marketers should ask as they think about how to market their app. And when it comes to that App Store experience, you're going to want to think about the anatomy of App Store optimization, because there are a bunch of things to take into account right away. And that starts with the app's title. What do you want people in the App Store to see? How does that convey the function of the app? Second, think about your icon design a lot. Instagram, which we're displaying here, is really effective because it gets across exactly what the app does in a fun, colorful way. People are viewing these apps on really tiny screens, so the icon is often the most important part. It's the way you make your app pop out from the competition. The description should be detailed, and it should have a few of the right keywords in it as well. If you're making a business app for time management, remember to use the phrase time management or productivity. When it comes to description, a few SEO tricks do work. Don't use too many keywords to make it look unnatural or sound unnatural, but don't neglect them entirely. More importantly, include screenshots of the app in action that show how easy it is and how the prospective users can accomplish exactly what they're looking to do. More, and, and also don't forget to research app categories. See where your app's going to fit and how your competitors are promoting their apps within the specific category. Reviews are really important too, but we'll get to those a little later. Right now, just know that they're very, very important when it comes to surfing, surfacing your app in the App Store and when it comes to actually getting those downloads. So, okay, let's say your app is optimized for the App Store. Let's, so now let's think about how to promote it on social media to different audiences. A lot of app promotion is powered by mobile deep links. Deep links personalize the mobile experience by sending mobile users directly into a specific page within an app or to an app store to download the app. They also detect device types so you can provide people with the most relevant experience. For example, Spotify links directly to the playlists within the app for users on mobile. This helps re-engage existing Spotify app users. And you can also see this is a paid promotion from Twitter. So they've tweeted a deep link that links to a specific playlist and when a, user, a mobile user clicks it and they have the Spotify app, they're immediately re-engaged. They go to the Spotify app, they go right to the playlist, and it's just a better experience in general. And you don't have to pay to promote deep links if you have the deep links enabled. Deep links can really help organically on social, so you can actually get a lot of free app downloads and re-engagement if you just tweet the right thing and use a deep link. The same goes for Facebook or any other social media channel where you can use those links. 
A lot of companies use Facebook paid ads to reach new users and engage existing ones. This is a mock-up of a Zappos ad, but it emphasized the importance of deep links in this process. If you run an ad for a specific product, but you don't use deep links to send users to that, this, that specific product page, it's likely they'll bounce. They're mobile users after all, and it's already hard enough to distract people from the ultimate distraction of Facebook. Mobile deep links send users directly to the product page that's advertised, which makes it much more likely that they'll make a purchase. That's why every paid social ad should deep link to a specific page. So when it comes to social sharing, deep links can actually grow app engagement and installs pretty much exponentially. Like once you click the button, that deep link is automatically created and if you're sharing something, people are clicking into that deep link. Here's an example from Associated Press which used the Bitly API to integrate Bitly deep links into every social share button that they have on all of their stories. That means that whenever a reader or a journalist shares a story through a publication's share buttons, they're actually creating a deep link automatically. So that doesn't change the workflow from AP's perspective, but it's massively enhanced app re-engagement and installs just because every time a mobile user sees that link and they click it, they go into the app or they go to the app store rather than just going to the mobile web. By programmatically creating deep links via social shares, brands can really enhance engagement and increase installs significantly. On the back end, if you're using Bitly deep links, you can actually track exactly how many downloads you get from every deep link. You can see which device is driving the most channels as well as uh, driving the most downloads as well as which channel is driving the most engagement and installs. This can be really helpful if you're wondering which user base is more active whether Android users come in from a different channel, whether desktop users interact with content differently, and all sorts of other things. So now let's move on to reviews. If you've ever bought anything online, you know how important reviews are. It doesn't matter if it's an app. Every review counts, and negative reviews really affect our perception of any product. You should always pay attention to what people are saying about your app, and without great reviews, you can't surface in the App Store, you won't get talked about, and people won't be searching for it. And really, reviews are a cornerstone of app marketing. They help with App Store optimization, and just a little bump can help a lot. Getting your rating from 2 to 3 stars increases conversion by 280%. Moving from 2 to 4 stars increases conversion by up to 540%. Even if you're at 3 stars, 50% of customers will stop considering downloading the app. They only want the best of the best, and you can see that from this chart. So one great way to build awareness of your app that pretty much everyone knows about is PR. And it, I know off the bat it can seem like the only apps that get promoted are from huge brands, but it's actually not that hard to get about a little bit of publicity at least. Um, and that's, it just means getting in touch with journalists, having a really cool elevator pitch for your app, and having really cool examples. Pitching is actually pretty easy, and you don't need a PR firm to do it. Just write a paragraph describing your app, make sure you have some collateral, collateral that you can use to back it up, and find some uh, email addresses from journalists. Videos are really helpful here, one sheets and case studies. Um, if you really want to grab attention, a journalist's attention, you should have a customer who's willing to talk about your app as well. That's really what journalists want these days, is not the product maker, but someone who's using the product. And if it's a good brand name or an interesting company that's using your app to do interesting things, that's even better. And I used to work at a PR firm. Don't waste your money on press releases. So we'll talk more about push notifications later. They can definitely help incentivize app users to review the app. The only issue here is that if someone has in, is having a negative experience and you still ask them to review the app, something bad could happen. Luckily, you can often personalize push notifications so that only frequent users are served them, and theoretically, those are people who are happy with the app experience. Likewise, you can use in-app messages to promote ratings. Here, BuzzFeed will ask readers to rate the app if they've been in the app long enough. A lot of apps do this, and it's a great way to just remind people to rate the app. Um, don't make it super annoying, but at the same time, if people are using the app frequently, there's a good chance that they like it, and they'll leave you a good review. Another good best practice here to think about is 
if you're going to get an indication that somebody is going to leave a bad review for you, it's best to find out before they actually leave that review in the App Store. So a lot of times it's really important to give users the opportunity to tell you in the app what they don't like. So if somebody's going to give you a star review, you can simulate that experience in your app and then collect the feedback and engage with them directly. It makes people feel like their opinions are being heard. That's a great point. Yeah, I, I think anything that allows customers to get that feedback to you before they storm off to the App Store is, is going to help a lot as well. And also, in addition to PR, just look for app review sites. There are a million of them out there. Um, look at their social media presences first, so see how many Twitter followers they have, Facebook fans. Um, app Store apps, appadvice148apps.com. Um, these are pretty active websites when it comes to app reviews, but it's also really hard to get an app noticed. If you go to those websites, you'll see that there's just dozens of apps exploding off the screen every time you visit the site. Um, but really every little bit helps, and if it doesn't cost a ton of money to get your app placed there, you might as well give it a try. Finally, and probably most importantly, you, you have to make the most out of word of mouth. Airbnb really has a great incentive program. Um, they've created this landing page that asks people to invite their friends and says that you can earn up to $100 for every friend that you invite. They've made it really easy by integrating Gmail contacts. You can also try and integrate social contacts as well. And all of these emails are personalized by default, which I find really interesting. And that can make a big difference when it comes to conversion. So again, just thinking of a reward for people who recommend your app to other people will really, really help in the end. And it doesn't have to be 100 bucks. It could be points. It could be some kind of gaming system or a rank or a little icon. I don't know. People like weird things. So hack number four is all about texting. It can be really tough to get people to the App Store if they're not actively browsing like we've talked about before. Texting is an interesting dynamic way to reach mobile users who might actually not be on their phones at that moment. For example, Groupon has a uh, landing page set up here where people can just input their phone number and get an automated link to download the app. This serves as another way to surface your app content in the web realm so web visitors can easily put in their number and that's important because sometimes people don't have their phones on them, they don't feel like taking them out, they don't feel like clicking six times to get to the app store, to download the app. Um, this is just an easy way for them to put in their number and have a link for when they are ready to download that app. And again, here Groupon can just promote this landing page as another way to uh, get in front of people and it's just, it's a really good way to have a different channel that ends up converting people to your app. Simon Malls, on the other hand, went offline. So if you have a number that people can text for downloads, you can experiment with anything offline. Bus ads, magazine ads, other media placements. Here, Simon put up posters in different malls that included a text-to-download link. Even cooler, they actually used a Bitly link to track how many clicks on that link there were, both for iPhones and Android. And this, this is a really simple, easy way to just see what's working and what isn't. Um, you can also just use a Bitly link for different locations, different media placements, and just see which one is getting the most clicks when people are clicking to download the app um, into the App Store. These probably aren't even deep links. And of course, BitLinks in general can help you track where all of those downloads are coming from, especially if you've enabled those deep links. Here we can see a client that used Bitly deep links to track app promotions across an email campaign, a home page, a banner ad, and Twitter. All of these channels are different. The only similarity is that they have a link in common. And you can actually drill down further to see which channels are most effective, what time of day each audience was most active, and where iOS and Android audiences tend to download or use their apps the most. So for our fifth hack, let's talk about in-app content. These kinds of messages pop up when a user is in the app, they can help them stick around, and maybe people won't delete the app quite as fast. So in-app can be really, really effective, but only 33% of marketers are actually using it right now. <clears throat> and again, this is, this is kind of weird considering that user retention when you use in-app messaging can be up to three and a half times higher. So it's really important 
it creates a personalized experience, and it makes people feel like the app actually cares about them, which is, makes it harder to delete something. So from a broad perspective, what is in-app content? It can be kind of divided into a few different categories, uh, behavioral, segmented, and local. And these are all based on data and uh, analytics here. So, for example, a behavioral in-app message can use historical data about a user's habits to create dynamic new content. Here we're taking a look at Beats. Beats actually uh, created a playlist for people based on the listener's previous uh, listening habits. So if you're really into Taylor Swift, you might discover some similar songs and artists within the same genre. Uh, and the same would go if you're into Slipknot or something. And you probably won't get Taylor Swift songs if historically you've only been listening to death metal songs. Second, they're mess segmented for different user groups. If you're a first-time user of InstaSize, for example, and Brian kind of mentioned this before, you're treated to a tutorial that basically takes you from start to finish on how to use the app and how you can be most effective with it. And, and that just, just guarantees that people will come back and use it in the future. Meanwhile, if you're browsing products in Gilt, um, an in-app message pops up about free shipping. Gilt, this is a pretty common practice for e-commerce because people know there's still hesitation as you're trying to buy something. And as long as that message which pops up at the right time in the right place, it could help nudge potential customers further down the funnel. So Brian and I talked about this last category of localized uh, in-app messages, and really it's not happening right now. It's, it's purely speculative, but the idea is that when, it, when you're near a store or in a specific location, the app could actually take that into account and send you a personalized message based on that location. And I think as we think about the future of apps, app marketing, and app users in general, what we're talking about here is context. Everybody's context changes all of the time because you can use an app in basically at any time, anywhere, in any situation, and the more you know about the location, the more personal that you can make that message. Yeah, I, one of the interesting things about this is this is kind of the holy grail for retail where this idea exists where you know where your consumers are at all times and when they're in proximity to your store, you can give them relative information that would make them more likely to purchase in-house. And that, as we can see, like with Apple, when they released this concept known as iBeacons, and then these vendors started creating software to make information pop up on your phone when you walked by it, it was something that people are clearly interested in, but we also have to take into consideration the context of the user and their preference for notifications. Um, it's, it's, it's really funny to me, actually, if I take a step back at it and look at the situation and say, okay, so I'm in a store, I'm walking through looking at merchandise, but I now need to be notified on my phone that I'm looking at that merchandise. Um, <laughs> so what's funny about it is what, and the use cases that will end up happening are not like, hey, look at me, I'm a nice sweater from Ralph Lauren. It's going to be, you know, add this to your shopping cart now and get an additional 20% off your purchase. So that we're going to be, that's a ways away, but it's what will come. It's just nobody's doing about it. Everybody's talking about it. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think the potential for that kind of contextual messaging is huge. And it, it, it's almost, the, the, the opportunities there are infinite, both from a consumer perspective and from a marketing perspective. Um, that concludes my apps. Brian, if you want to take over for the next five hacks, go for it. Sounds good. So, so the first thing we're going to talk about are email campaigns. Now, traditionally, when you're a mobile marketer and you think about email, you probably immediately think, I really don't want to use this because it's a terrible user experience. However, with deep links, email is now a channel that you have access to. So traditionally, what would end up happening without deep links is that, let's say you have a user, and that user has your application the deep link would allow you to open up that application to the item you're actually promoting. Without deep links, or without using some form of deep links like universal links, you'd be taking to a mobile website where even if the user has your app installed, they would then be on that site. And we all know that mobile websites historically perform in a, um, they perform not as well as your mobile app would, or at least it should. And one of the interesting things about this is it opens up a ton of use cases. Email is a huge marketing channel, and it's incredibly inexpensive. 
which is unlike the stats that we talked about earlier. So as a mobile marketer, it's kind of refreshing to look at this and say, oh, wow, I can actually open this channel up. However, you're probably wondering, well, what, how do I know what device they're on? This is another great thing about Deep Links. Deep Links, the branch Deep Link allows you to know which platform they're on. It's one of the things that we care about. And I know that this is something that you don't want to list like three or four links here. It's like, hey, if you're on Android, do this. Or if you're one of the three people in the world on BlackBerry, do this. But, you know, these are things that the system can take care of for you and create a good, really, really good user experience. So we actually have run several tests with this. We wanted to verify whether the channel would actually work. It should work, right? You're sending emails to people who have opted into your channel. They email is a really good channel for engaging people about sales and items in particular. We ran a test, and for example, what you're seeing here is an email from our, our client called Bento. And what they noticed was that they significantly increased sessions from their app from email marketing. It's a wonderful tool. So it's the ultimate opt-in. There are all sorts of laws telling users that they can get out of an email notification process. So if they're in there, they're in there, and the information is super targeted and rel relevant to them. And then by deep linking them to the content in the app, you create a better relationship with the app. It's, it's a really wonderful marketing tool. Hack number seven, content sharing. So at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do is decrease our total cost of user acquisition so that we can build a viable business model on an app. And one of the most effective ways to get people to discover that you exist in the world is to increase the likelihood that they can share that content with their friends, either on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. All of these channels are incredibly important, but the question is, how do you get it there? The interesting thing about deep linking is that you're able to, with one link, send somebody to the right location. And what's nice about this is I can, as a user, opt in. So as you see here, what we're looking at is the standard iOS share sheet. And this gives you an opportunity. Let's say you're looking at this spike. And you know that your friend AC really has been shopping for this. She really likes green bikes. This gives you an opportunity to share with this person something incredibly contextual to them. And in this situation, if AC doesn't have this app, our client Close 5, when, if AC gets this link, we'll know, and your deep link, should, deep link provider should know that she does or does not have the app installed. So let's say she doesn't. This takes her to the App Store. And then after that, when the app opens, the first time user experience that we were talking about earlier is going to be that green bike. It's not going to be, hey, log in with your Facebook account. Hey, you know, like give us like 17 pieces of information about you. It's going to be the green bike. And you can trigger whatever onboarding process you want after you get the green bike. It results in, we see tremendous results from being able to do that kind of thing. So in particular, one of the things we were just talking about was increase in sign-up conversion. So standard user onboarding versus customized user onboarding are fundamentally different things. And there's a number of ways you can do it. One of the great things about deep links is you can pack all sorts of information into a link. Parameters that tell the application certain bits of information about where the user is coming from contextually, either before an install or after an install. And what this allows you to do is create incredibly personalized experiences. When you are made to feel this way, where you see this content that's coming in, where you are, you maybe see the face of the person who referred you in because we know that that person was a user in the application, it makes you feel incredibly optimized for. And people are far more likely to sign up and start using the app in the test that we've seen when you create these personalized experiences as a result of sharing. It's the highest form of referral. I'm your friend Elizabeth, I'm sending you this, I think you'll love it, check it out is a wonderful way to get somebody to download your app. And these kind of social, less expensive channels are wonderful ways to make conquering kind of the obstacles that we laid out at the beginning feel more acceptable. It makes, that also makes sense. When I look at it, it's, if I have an app that we know has intrinsic value, we just, we can't break into the top 300, we see a lot of virality, a lot of sharing, 
this is a great way to increase installs and make yourself more um, aware to your audience. So the other thing that we notice is that with sh by sharing content, once the user has been welcomed into an app with this type of deep linked content, we see vastly improved user retention and engagement. So we did a study across millions of links, and we wanted to compare deep links versus the links that existed inside of the applications in our system, and we looked at people who came in through these types of links and this specific type of content to share with them, and you see dramatic improvements in user retention, both one day, one week, and 30 day, and what this allows you to do by providing this kind of content, this contextual content to a user, is it allows you to start chipping it away at the disadvantages that we see in the marketplace for the app system, app ecosystem. So 80% loss of users on day one, well, you know what? We allow you to start chipping away at that providing, by providing better experiences. So we're going to step into something that might feel counterintuitive. We're calling this app content previews, but I think it's really important to think about. When you think about a deep link experience, and the traditional experience, if you get a link that takes you to the App Store, let's say, let's start on the left. I have a, my app, amazingly, content in my app shows up on the Google search engine. There are specific ways you can do that that um, people should really start investing in, but let's say you've done that and you have your app content index so that it shows up. What's nice about this is that you, your normal experience is you go, this link would take you to the App Store. And what you see on the left is just a little preview of what's coming, but what you're going to get to in the app, app on the right is something that's gorgeous and engaging and what you've created your entire app experience around. But that middle part, that App Store, is incredibly unappealing, right? You get taken to this and you're like, wait, what? I was just looking at this recipe for sauteed Brussels sprouts and now I'm on all the cooks. I don't understand why I'm seeing all the cooks. Who is all the cooks? This concept you have in there, this Brussels sprouts recipe is what got that person engaged. And what, we, what we've been exploring is this idea of allowing users to engage with your native app content ahead of being in the native app so they get hooked on the thing that you're creating. And what this allows you to do is improve the likelihood of the conversion through the funnel. So instead of having this jolting experience of going to the App Store, the user sees this and then they can make an intelligent decision about whether to install the app once they've seen the content. These things are incredibly important to look at. We call our product deep views. There's a number of, there's a number of ways you can approach this, but what's incredibly important about these experiences is you customize them so they look like your brand. And then when you get there, the results are, like I said, it's so counterintuitive, but we see a dramatic increase in clicked install rates just by interceding in this terrible app store flow. So there's this ecosystem that exists that forces you to have a sub-optimized funnel. And what we're trying to do is chip away at that funnel by providing you other avenues. And this is a really counterintuitive but interesting way to think about it. Now, we've been running some tests in different channels where Let's say you're on Facebook and you already have a really gorgeous image that shows kind of what that native app experience is like. This may not, may not make sense in that context. So you have to think about when you would deploy something like this, but it's incredibly interesting to think about pulling content from your app, putting it in the mobile web dynamically, making a user, uh, giving it a user an opportunity to see it, and then giving them the opportunity to engage with it before they get into your app. It's like the ultimate advertisement. So now we're going to go back to the topic that Blaze brought up earlier, which is push notifications. Push notifications, I'm kind of sighing actually when I hear myself talking about this because I think that we all have kind of a love-hate relationship with push notifications. So this is something that came up on our, my phone yesterday actually while I was driving, which is hilarious. And Apple, as we all know, is engaged in this battle with the FBI right now. I while driving, for some reason, need to be notified from the New York Times that Apple is working on making their phones even more secure, which should be real. Uh, everyone should understand this if you're following the story, but this reaction that I have, this frustration that I'm driving and I get this push notification, results in what we see on the left. The vast majority of people 
to whom we try to opt in to push notifications have no interest in receiving these types of information. It's because it feels invasive or it can feel invasive. So it's important as a mobile marketer, and I'm sure you all understand this intuitively, to really think about the context and the user before. So let's walk through some of that information. So Kahuna put out this really interesting um, blog post about this. And one of the things that it, it was fun to look at was looking at push notification engagement by vertical and by industry. And it makes sense when you think about it, but I'm going to walk through some of this in a couple of examples. So opt-in rates are generally 60% out. What we're looking at are engagement rates, but there's also similar, there's a similar parallel for opt-in rates as well. Let's talk about financial services. The opt-in rate for financial services is actually far higher than what the 40% you traditionally see. And that's because users intrinsically understand that the information that they're going to get from their bank should be relevant. If I'm going to be notified that somebody has stolen my credit card, I will be more likely to be interested in getting notified of that automatically. And I think people get push notifications. Same thing with utilities, ride sharing. If people want to know when their Uber is outside. This just makes sense. But we also see this we see a change in behavior after that. So it's not just that they opt in, but what you're seeing here is engagement by industry. So this means that of the 50 to 60% of these particular categories that would opt in because they're more interested in seeing it, we see engagement rates with those push notifications higher based on like the different types of apps that you have. So it may make sense to think about deploying a push notification strategy depending on the category you're in and understand the realities of what you're moving into. So let's talk about how to optimize that experience. So cadence. Cadence is incredibly important. The last thing you want to be is a push notification spammer for a number of reasons. One, it's incredibly hard to turn off push notifications once you have them on. So the only option for a user, if you create a terrible experience, is to have them delete your app. So it's the last thing you want to do. You really want to think about how often you send these messages, why you send them to them. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. One of the things I've noticed engaging with the New York Times app over time is that they're clearly building a model based on the content with which I've entertained, with which I've engaged. And they know what types of things I find interesting. I, even though I was frustrated by my Apple push notification, I'm an Apple fanboy. They know this about me. I think I read every single article in the New York Times about Apple. So I got that push notification yesterday, and it's an incredibly effective way to get somebody. I just can't get them all the time. Personalization, this is something we didn't see in the New York Times, but it is something that's really relevant. I, in my last job, I worked at a company that offered push notifications for mobile applications. And one of the things that we noticed that was incredibly effective at getting people to engage was making a push notification feel tailored to the individual. It doesn't have to be the name of the person that you're, text, that you're sending a push notification to, but it can be. It can be something as simple as tailoring that information to what they viewed last time, giving them a discount based on their behavior that's incredibly apparent to them. Running these types of campaigns can dramatically improve your engagement rate. One thing that we wish to talk about is timing. So it makes sense when you stop and think about it. But most people, when they first start running push notification, push notification campaigns, don't. So let's talk about timing. I should not send you a push notification at 3 in the morning. I really shouldn't. Unless you've specifically somehow told me you're always up every single day at 3 in the morning, I should never send you a push notification at 3 in the morning. So what you really should do is start thinking about how you're going to test this and understand open rates and engagement rates with your users after. And so what we see is that the vast majority of people like to engage with this during the course of their day. They don't like to engage with it before their day gets started, and they don't like to engage with it at night when they get home. They want to be notified about something that's going on in the course. Now this is different for timely events, right? Like news and those types of things you want to be notified about. But if you're trying to engage users about non-critical information, you need to think about when you're going to send it to them. Another thing to think about within the context of timing is time zones. So it should make sense that when you distribute your app in other app stores, 
around the world that you need to make sure that your push notification strategy accommodates those same times, those same times of day for those users. So you shouldn't have a global push notification strategy. There's a lot of tools out there that will allow you to do these brute force push notifications. But what's really important is to pull back and try to find a software tool that allows you to really critically and narrowly tailor that push notification and create a personalized experience. I'm going to end on emojis because this is going to help me transition into my next point, which is that sometimes what you're going to do is craft the most amazing push notification that you can think of. It's going to be this beautiful piece of prose. We actually hosted a, a meetup a couple of weeks ago, a mobile growth meetup, and we had this amazing woman from Prolific Interactive get up and talk about this, but she tested this with one of her clients where they they it was a it was a, a clothing it was a I guess it was a retail brand that had its own app and it was testing this amazingly targeted beautiful push notification pros that they had hired writers to create against just a bunch of emojis because they wanted to see what was more effective and what they noticed was that what was more effective was the emoji and it's it felt a little deflating to that team, that group of marketers who had spent a lot of time crafting that perfect message, but it's always important to remember that we are in a medium that has a different method of communication. It may not make sense to get an email with a bunch of emojis in it, but it does make sense to get an, a push notification with a bunch of emojis in it because that is the way that people, and particularly that brand's group, interacted with their friends and with the people in their life. It made that brand feel more, more, much more accessible. So emojis for that company specifically resulted in a fundamental improvement in engagement rates. So finally we're going to talk about influencers and third parties. So I'm not going to transition to the slide for a couple of seconds just because I, I want you to pay attention to me and not the images, but we all know the power of celebrity and the power of influencers. We see YouTube channels dedicated to reviews for these people build millions of followers and we see celebrities in commercials promoting everything from cologne to bottled water. And we know intrinsically as marketers that these things have influence, but as mobile marketers that are, mo that are marketing mobile apps, it's also important. This is not something that necessarily just exists for a new world. I think in the last couple of years, We've mobile has become so important that and apps are so relevant to our audiences that when you look at it, it makes sense that people would start looking at this space and, and thinking about it as an opportunity to generate revenue from as an influencer. So let's talk about something that I helped participate in, which was really interesting. Glue Games. So Glue Games was a client of my last um, company and they created a bunch of really interesting games. They were a successful publisher and but their audience was traditionally actually mostly harder of core male users who were interested in under, who were interested in first person shooter games. But they had this amazing idea which was, you know what, we want to get into social gaming, but we don't want to be like all of the other social games out there. And they interacted with these celebrity clientele. Now this is an extreme example, right? Because I think Kim Kardashian would probably be, if you, what you were looking for is somebody to influence your brand and get attention for you, she's a great example, but they built an entire category of game and they became an early leader by finding a celebrity endorser who really drove engagement and usage with this audience. And that person's persona, that person's Twitter, that person's TV appearances drove amazing amounts of user acquisition that allowed them the opportunity to invest in more games. And it's incredibly interesting to me to look at how, how fundamentally successful the strategy this was. We're not all going to get Kim Kardashian. We're not going to then spread to the Kardashian clan, but we, there are celebrity endorsers out there for everyone. One of my friends actually is creating a uh, dog food delivery service, which I, I don't know if that's just because we live in San Francisco and this is the market we're in, but 
what's interesting about this is as they reach, when they started looking at this opportunity, there are many, many people who have hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram and on YouTube and on Twitter that talk about their dogs and their um, experiences with them. And these are great opportunities for you to think about how you want to engage these people. And it's something that we shouldn't forget, that just because we're in mobile apps, we think, oh, I'm going to be an app store optimization. No. The power of celebrity and the power of influence is still there. And if anything, it's incredi incredibly more relevant because it's so hard to stick out from the crowd in the app store. This is a wonderful way to kind of leverage a traditional method of marketing and put it into your mobile marketing strategy. So that's all that I have today. All right. Thanks, Blaze and Brian. That was great. I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that mobile is here to stay, and I think you guys offered a lot of great options uh, for the folks on the call. Just a reminder, we will send out a copy of this recording next week so you can revisit all of the great insights from the presentation. If you'd like to learn more about Deep Links from Branch, go ahead and visit bnc.lt slash deep hyphen links. If you'd like to download Bitly's app ebook, visit bitly.is slash deep links. And if, remember, if you want to ask Blaze or Brian questions, feel free to type them into the chat box or ask us on Twitter using the hashtag bettermobile. And we actually have a handful of great ones that have come through already. So I think we can jump right in. Uh, we have some curiosity around Android versus Apple. Uh, which users are more likely to download these apps? Um, just down so, in general. Brian, you want to take it first? Yeah, so I, I think the thing that we try to focus on is not just who's going to download it, but who's going to engage with it and then create revenue for you. We look at um, <clears throat> a number of, I guess, health metrics to kind of understand how we want to, uh, I guess, advise our customers on wh where they should proceed. And we generally see with our users that iOS users are more valuable to them than Android users. So you're more willing to spend more to acquire an iOS user. I don't know if, if that's a trick. I know that Google has been attempting to kind of chip away at that for a long time. Um, by offering more premium handsets and doing a number of things to kind of increase the likelihood that I guess people with more disposable income would would spend money in apps and or be desirable to advertisers that would fund apps that are based on an advertising uh, I guess business model. But iOS users are far more valuable to advertisers and they tend to spend more money. Um, in terms of volume, there's clearly far more Android devices out in the world. I think it's like 4x the number of Android devices as there are iOS devices. So if what you're looking for is a volume play, um, it, clearly you'll get more Android, but that, to us I think that's less relevant. We want to think about who the quality um, users are for your business model. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Just from our perspective, we definitely see more Android downloads. Um, and that goes to Brian's point that more people have Android phones, especially globally. Um, in that case study at the bottom right there, our, I think that client saw two times as many Android uh, just installs in general. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, by no means does that mean Android users are more valuable in the long run. So that's also important to keep in mind. Awesome. So I'm wondering if you guys can speak a little bit to what an app should look and feel like. Um, I think maybe some novice, some novices might think you can just sort of copy and paste your website copy and call it a day, but um, something tells me that that is maybe not a best practice. Um, sure, I can take that a little bit. I think that the important thing to keep in mind when you're developing an app is the use case for it, right? So if it's just going to be essentially a responsive website, you might not even want to bother making it or promoting it because it can be expensive and it's just more resources to waste on something that could go to a great responsive website. I think apps in general need to have some serious uh, secondary function to your business, whether that's a reservation app for a restaurant or a booking app for a hotel. Um, you know, health apps do this really well. Nike with 
with all of the things that they do, um, trying to stay connected with people through not you know product oriented apps, but through health apps. Um, anything that gets people interested in checking out that app more than a few times a month, pretty much. If they're only going to make a purchase on it, if they're only going to read about your company on it, uh, I don't know. I, I would say that it might not be worth the trouble. Brian, what do you think? I, I think that you know there's some macro trends that are, I think, driving the question uh, or driving that particular trend, where people are creating apps because people will use apps. I mean, that on we've seen some numbers where we see like some, I think it's something like when you're on your phone, about 85% of the time you're engaging with an app like a non-platform app, um, which we found astonishing, and we think the vast majority of that time is in Facebook. So there's a natural I guess predisposition to believe, well, if I don't have an app, I'm not relevant to mobile user experience. I think I would tend to agree with your point, Blaze, which is that, well, look, if you're not going to add anything meaningful to your mobile app, well, then why are you doing it? Is it just because you need to have a mobile app? That experience is incredibly challenging. Um, I, to answer the, I guess, the questioner's question, like the app should look like your brand, and it should feel like your brand. It should just feel and function like an app in the sense it should feel like a native app. It shouldn't feel like a slow web view of your whatever it is you have in another ecosystem. And when you want to build that app, it should improve the functionality in some way. And the only reason you should keep investing in that app is if you see material improvements in some key metrics. So let's say you're retail. What you care about is revenue generated in, from those customers. So if customers are spending more in your mobile app because you cre create maybe more smooth experiences, maybe you can provide nice three-dimensional previews of the clothes they're wearing, maybe there's some sort of interesting, like, photography you can do where you can actually take a selfie and see what that shirt's going to look like on you. Those are all things that you can't do in a mobile website that you can do because native applications open up a lot of functionality that doesn't exist. And then there's also interesting components about purchasing, um, There, especially as we move into a realm of things like Apple Pay and Samsung Pay. You can actually fundamentally improve purchasing experience by opting into platform-specific payment methodologies that allow you to decrease, like, de to decrease, I guess, congestion in the funnel. And that's something also to think about. Awesome. Um, we have someone here asking if we have a sense for what percentage of users end up actually enabling location sharing. We talked about location-based uh, apps. Do we have a sense for how many people actually opt into that? So I launched a location-based product um, a, a couple of companies ago. One of the things that we found interesting was that people, I guess I can, I'll be generic about it because I don't know really I can talk about it. There were, first of all, there were not many apps who really wanted to do it. Um, and when people did start doing it, they realized that the only way to get somebody to share your location with them is if the app's core functionality was relevant to that location. It's, it's one of the most incredibly personal things in the world is to share your location. It also tends to be very resource intensive and people, I think, intrinsically understand that in the sense that it drains their battery to track your location at all times. So we saw at the beginning, uh, what was interesting is we, there were a lot of tests that had to happen So with messaging to get people to be aware of why you're asking for the location. So um, you should understand that it's going to be low at first unless you make it incredibly clear why you need it and how it's going to improve their app functionality. So it makes sense, right, when you Google Maps to have to share your location, otherwise the app's not going to function. But if you're um, Cole Hahn, why do I need your location? How is it going to in inherently improve my experience? You'll improve opt-in rates if, let's say, you're Cole Hahn and what you're doing is asking for the location when they're looking for stores. Only at that moment, not at the beginning. Awesome. So if we're thinking about app metrics, what do you think is important to focus on, uh, at least early on? What should you be looking at? And do those metrics evolve over time? Um, I don't know, Brian, if you have anything to contribute to this, but I would definitely say installation. Installations and engagement, again, just how many people are actually downloading the app and sticking around and using it. Um, and also, I would say just look at your reviews and see what people think of it. Um, I think that can definitely be a good indicator of if the app is proving to be useful. And you may have to go through a few iterations of finding out what users really want from your app. Um, in terms of what your brand can provide them in addition to what your brand already does. Right. So 
I think it's incredibly important to understand that your app should have, there are some basic health, I guess, metrics that would exist in the world, right? You'll want to know how many people are installing, what their day one retention is, what their day seven retention is, what their day, their day 30 retention is. These are things that, let's say, you opt into a free analytic service. You'll see basic dashboards about acquisition, retention, and engagement. And you'll have an idea of how, how often people come back into your app, and those are all you know, useful bits of information, but they lack the context to your business. So you may be like, you may, let's say you're in a, you're in a service that's like, oh, you perform better than 80% of your, 80% of people in the world with, who have apps on engagement. Well, what does that mean to you? Why does people using your app actually matter? What's the metric that actually matters to you is probably the most important. So there's app health ecosystem kind of metrics that are on every single analytics dashboard in the world. And those are relevant because if you have an app that nobody's using, then you've clearly failed. However, what matters to you may be something fundamentally different. You may only care about purchase. You may only care about video views. You only care about, you know, there's a number of ways for you to measure the effectiveness. And so what's, I think, most important is to find the use cases that you care about, find the business metric that you want to improve and measure to that. And if you're not doing that, then what you have is a test concept app that is that isn't moving your business forward. Right. Um, I think we have one final question here. Uh, we have someone asking if you have any resources or where can people learn more about getting their mobile content to show up in Google search? We have written a number of blogs about this and in our follow-up email to this we can include a link um, and we'll be happy to share that with you. Awesome. Well, I want to thank both Blaze and Brian for all of their great insights today, and we appreciate everyone who dialed in, and we hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, guys.